Okay, so my name is Alexei, and today I'm going to talk about vandalism detection in knowledge bases. So first, a few words about me. So uh, my background is databases. So I did my bachelor in information systems, and then I worked as a Java developer for a few years. And then I decided to go into data analytics. I did a master's in BI, and then uh, after that I started working as a data scientist. In my free time, I uh, participate in data science competitions. And today, my talk will be about one of those competitions, which is about predicting vandalism in uh, knowledge bases. I'm also a proud member of Open Data Science. This is a community of Russian-speaking data scientists. So if you speak Russian and not there yet, please go there and join. So this is the place where I actually learned about this competition. And yeah, it's uh, like the platform is not very famous, so. So let's start. So what is a knowledge base? A knowledge base is a, a machine-readable database, for, like machine-readable uh, way of uh, representing knowledge. And typically, uh, like today, uh, like most uh, uh, widespread uh, way of representing knowledge is uh, in form, RD, in form uh, RDF triples, which is uh, subject, predicate, object, and then uh, subject and uh, object are some entities or concepts and then predicate describes the relation between two entities. Um, so for instance, when I studied at TU Berlin, uh, my professor who was teaching machine learning was uh, Klaus Robert Müller, and we can represent this knowledge in this graph. So Klaus Robert Müller works at TU Berlin, and he teaches machine learning. And with that approach, with such graphs, we can represent basically anything we want. And so, for instance, machine learning is also a part of uh, computer science, so this way we have a linked graph of things, and we can uh, use that for many things. Uh, for instance, it's very useful for enhancing user experience, so for instance, when you go to Google and want, you want to search for something, for instance, for some movie, and you look for Titanic, and Google recognizes that Titanic is a movie, and it shows you some additional information, like. Uh, the cast of Titanic, when it was filmed, and so on. This is done all thanks to knowledge bases. So of course you see that this is very useful, and it's very uh, expensive to obtain such databases, because uh, a good quality knowledge base should be uh, created by hand. Uh, like there are automatic ways, but they usually have uh, not as good quality as uh, um, good knowledge bases. And one of such uh, knowledge base is uh, Wikidata. So Wikidata is uh, a project by, like it follows the same idea as Wiki, uh, Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a free encyclopedia and Wikidata is a free knowledge base. Everybody can go there to Wikidata and enter whatever information they want. So this is very useful, but unfortunately some people abuse the system and uh, put, uh, uh, incorrect information, uh, offensive information, they can put the F word, they can put uh, something that is not true. For instance, here we see that um, machine learning page uh, from Wikidata, so this is a page about machine learning, and you can go there and put uh, some useful facts about machine learning. And for instance, I go there and I don't like machine learning, and I go there and say, okay, machine learning is pseudoscience, it's not really science, it's, yeah. And I can save it. And then all the systems that use this data will think that machine learning is not really a thing. Um, yeah, so to fight that, uh, Wikidata employs moderators who go through all suggested edits, all suggested revisions, and they manually say, okay, this, re this revision is good, we approve it, or no, this revision is not good, we roll it back. And of course we can help moderators and use machine learning for that to like, because they manually have to go through many, many, many revisions. Uh, it's quite popular nowadays. And yeah, what we can do is we can use machine learning to help them to have a short, li a short list of candidates, candidate revisions that they should go through and manually uh, roll, decide if it needs rollback or not. So with that in mind, the organizers of Wisdom Cup, uh, they collected the data of Wikidata revisions and they challenged the data science community to build such a model to help moderators. So the goal of this competition was given a revision, uh, uh, the model should predict if this revision should be rolled back or not. 
Um, has anybody participated in uh, Kaggle competitions? Okay, so you know, uh, like in Kaggle, um, you usually, like the, the organizers, they provide a uh, train data set, they provide test data set, and they provide labels for train data set. Participants download the, uh, all the data sets, they train model on train data, they apply it to test data, and they upload predictions. This is how it's done in Kaggle, and then you immediately see your results on the leaderboard. It's not like that. It's very different. So here, instead of submitting predictions, participants submitted uh, code. And this code was in a virtual machine. So, uh, and participants never saw actually uh, test data. All they did was submitting the code, then code run. So it uh, listened to some socket where it read data from, then uh, model was applied and sent back the predictions. And th this virtual machine had uh, some hardware limitations. So there was only one core, one CPU, and four gigs of RAM. And this is how it looked like. So like there, we just needed to provide some command which needed to be executed and hit run. At the end, unlike Kaggle, there is nothing. It, it just says, okay, the run was successful or not. On Kaggle, you usually see some uh, score at the end. Here is nothing. So okay, the problem, the data set. The data set. So the data set was provided in uh, raw dump, the dump from uh, Wikipedia from the, end of, uh, from the beginning of time, still 2016. Uh, it was 72 million revisions, quite a large data set, and when uncompressed, it was almost half a terabyte of data. It's pretty large. And it, it was also very skewed, because most of the revisions, they are good, and only a quarter of percent, they were rolled back. So it's very skewed, and m most of the examples, they are negative. Uh, they are negative, they are good. They don't need to be rolled back. So before approaching, before starting training a model, like everybody should think, okay, how we are going to validate this model. Organizers actually thought of that, and they provided a split of data into three parts, train validation and test. But as I said, test was never released, so it it was only accessible through the virtual machine. So what participants had was uh, train data and validation data. And from that, I took this data and did split myself. So I took validation data as test. And then the beginning of uh, 2016, I used this validation data and I took only the data for 2015 as test. So I took only a small part of the revisions because uh, I thought, the way Vandals behave now, it's probably different from the way Vandals behave in 2012. So probably I should concentrate only on the most recent uh, uh, data. And not only that, uh, also like the data set was quite large and somehow I needed to process it. So I had only 32 gigs of RAM on my machine. So like, looking only at one year of data was enough to actually fit this data set into RAM taking more, uh, yeah, RAM wasn't enough. So this is how the data looks like. So this is uh, one of the pages from the dump. So here we have uh, title of the page, and we have some information about the revision. Who was the us user who suggested the revision? Uh, username, if uh, the username is lo not locked into Wikidata, then we have the IP address of that user. We have some comments there, and then we have the actual uh, content of the entire page in form, like in JSON format. So what we can use for machine learning here for our model? Apparently we can take title there because some of the pages there may be more controversial than others and they are targeted more often by vandals than others. So for instance, uh, the page about President Trump probably is edited more often than a page about snails. And yeah, so it totally makes sense to include title there. Then of course we should also use user, because some of the users maybe they tend to be more vandalic than others. And it's not only user, it's also the IP of the user when it, the user is not logged in. Then for the revisions, we also have comments. And we have the JSON format. So I didn't use JSON uh, content because uh, it was too big. And uh, yeah, it wasn't really possible to, to see it too um, like two revisions and see what changed between those two revisions. So it was too, uh, too cumbersome, so I decided not to use the content and used only uh, title, username, and comment. So 
So for a title, it's simple. I just take the title and use it as a feature. So for user, it's a bit more complex because uh, like we not only have username, but IP. So if user no, is not locked in, then we say, okay, user is anonymous, and then we look at the IP and try to extract some useful features from the, the IP. So of course, the most straightforward thing we can do with IP is just to take IP itself and use it as a feature. But sometimes some people, they probably, uh, maybe they have dynamic IP. Every time they go to internet, the IP changes. So it also makes sense to look at the subnet. So maybe the last digit changes, but the three things before, they stay the same. So the next time user goes in to internet and tries to make some offensive, um, offensive uh, edits to Wikidata, then uh, yeah, oh, we should get this user. And then also from IP we can um, get information about geography of that user, like country, like this particular user was from uh, uh, the UK, which is in Great Britain, which is in European Union, so we can use that. And the way we use it is uh, one-hot encoding. So what one hot encoding is, is basically we take uh, like every possible feature, we have a very large matrix, and then for each feature we put one there if uh, we see this feature there. So for instance, if we see that this user is from Great Britain, then we put one against Great Britain. The way I did this uh, was I usually work with texts, so I just put all these features together in one string, uh, I tokenize it on space, and then I use count vectorizer from scikit-learn to actually build that matrix. So what it does, count vectorizer inside, it looks at each token and then it sees, okay, this token goes to column number 100 and then it puts one there. And then this is the matrix that we can work with and use machine learning for that. Uh, so that is for user. So if user is logged in, then we all we have, all we know about the user is just username. Then we have comments feature, uh, comment features. It's a bit more structured. So here are four examples of comments. Uh, so apparently this is machine generated. And uh, we can see that there are multiple parts, the part, the structured part inside the comment thing. So we can take it and uh, again uh, decompose it into tokens and then use that as uh, in our uh, one hot encoding matrix. And then the second comment is interesting because we see that there is uh, interwiki links, so in these double square brackets. Uh, so when we want to add a fact about a certain uh, entity, then uh, the, the, the system generates a comment that looks like that. And so when I say that machine learning is a pseudoscience, then is a, as a property which gets some name, and pseudoscience is also a concept in Wikidata which also has some code name. And for instance, in, Wiki, in Wikidata they have a special page for crap, and if somebody says, okay, machine learning is crap, then uh, uh, we can use that to actually see that this is probably vandalic, and uh, yeah, so uh, the model should figure that out. And also there is some uh, free text outside of the comments, like origin web browser, yeah, we can just take it and use as uh, usual, uh, usual text. And we can put this in this one hot encoding matrix and, yeah, and train machine learning model. So here we have very large matrices, very sparse, very high dimensionality, what we should do with these matrices, what kind of model we should use. So when I have a problem like that, the first thing I do is I train an SVM, linear SVM, with uh, L1 penalty, which produces sparse solutions. And this is usually the model that I use as a baseline, and more often than not, this is the model I end up using at the end after trying uh, multiple other things. So what I did here was I took each feature, like title feature, user feature, um, like all other features from comments, um, alone, and then I tried to build a uh, SVM model on them. And so what is the, um, what is the performance of uh, uh, this feature with SVM? So you see that, okay, so it takes a while because uh, like uh, linear SVC from scikit-learn, it uses slip linear inside, which is not parallel, it runs only on one core. Uh, but still, like half an hour for uh, like a lot of data is a decent performance. 
Yeah, so they see that uh, like just using user features, we can already get 93% of AUC. So this is pretty decent. Uh, so can we do better? On Kaggle, like people who ever participated on Kaggle know that uh, usually the way to achieve good performance is combine models, is take several models and ensemble them. So I thought, okay, I should do the same and just take the output of these uh, models, put them together. So what we do is we train each model separately, then we take output of this model, put them together and train another model on top of that. And this is called stacking. And this, I, I try to do that here in hope that it will be very good. And indeed on uh, like the numbers that I got on validation looked promising, like it was 1% better than previously. But then I checked this against my test data set and it turned out that it wasn't really that good. It was as good as the user feature, as user SVM that I had. So apparently because of this high skewness of the data, uh, these ensembles picked up some noise and at the end they overfit. So, okay, I thought the data is skewed, what we can do with that? When the data is skewed, then there is a class imbalance. What, like there are multiple way, ways to fight this imbalance. Is the, the most, and most popular ways is oversample the majority class or undersample the minority class. So we take one class and then we sample with replacement from that class until we reach a certain proportion that we want. So 50-50 or 72, well, 70-30, um, whatever. Uh, yeah. And I tried that. I, was, I spent quite a lot of time trying to find the right proportion and uh, see if it helps. And then it was all not helpful. So the reason I, for that, I think, is um, when we train the model on the entire data, it rather learns the negative examples. So it sees what revisions are good and they are quite diverse. And then we remove this information when we undersample the majority class. Uh, we lose this information about good revisions. And uh, yeah, when we apply this to unseen data, it, it becomes worse. And the same with oversampling, because I think uh, like there are so few uh, bad revisions, then when we oversample, the model gets like it overfits, basically. Yeah, so at the end, I just took all these features, all these sparse matrices, put them together, and run a single uh, SVM on, on that. Um, but there was a problem. So um, remember at the beginning I said that the code should be run in, within a virtual machine, and this virtual machine had uh, hardware limitations. So there was only four gigabytes of RAM. But when I did that, the dictionary was too large. So what I mean by dictionary is when we try to build this uh, large one hot encoding matrix, we need to figure out where each token in this matrix goes. So we know that if user, if, uh, if user has a username, username, then we put one into column number zero. Then if this user is anonymous and it's from Great Britain, then we could put seven into put one into number, into column number seven, and so on. We need to keep track of these tokens and their, where they go, and it results in a very large, huge uh, dictionary. Uh, and this is a problem because at the end it occupied like two uh, gigabytes of RAM, and the way I needed to do this is I train this uh, vectorizer, I save it, put it into virtual machine, and then in virtual machine when I execute this against test data, this needs to be loaded into memory, and then there is not enough uh, RAM for other things. So there is other way of doing this one hot encoding, and this is called hashing trick, and it's implemented in uh, scikit-learn in hashing vectorizer. So instead of keeping this dictionary of uh, with mapping from token to column number, what we can do is just take token, then compute the hash of this token, modulo some big number, and that would be the uh, index of the column where we put one. Uh, so clearly we don't need a dictionary now, uh, so it's, it virtually acquires no uh, memory because all we need is take hash and uh, decide where it goes. But again, there could be some collisions because the same tokens could map into one bucket. Uh, so there is a trade-off and uh, the, the, the feature space, the like, um, 
the dimensionality of this one-hot encoding matrix should be quite large to, um, to make sure that we have as few collision, collisions as possible. This was my final model. So I used one-hot encoding with this Hessian vectorizer that occupies no memory. But uh, on the other side, the weights for the model were, were quite larger. So because the dimensionality of this uh, one-hot encoding is quite large, then we have more parameters, and then they took take more spice, but it's 300 megabytes is a lot less than two gigs. Yeah, and with that model, I was able to achieve 96% uh, of AUC, and I used that, I decided to use it as, as my final model. And that's the final results. So, like during the competition, I never knew how well I perf perform against other teams, and then finally they released the the final standings, and I turned out to be second. That's me there. Yeah, and if you see here, you know, can you see the cursor? The runtime is because I wanted to use a very simple model, and uh, I used this Hessian trick, and SVM is a linear model, which is very good. It resulted in a very good runtime. So it, it was a few million of revisions, so I needed to read them from socket and read back, so it, like there is some overhead. But again, the other guys, they probably use some Deep nets, I don't know. Yeah, uh, so it was a lot faster than anything else and not as bad. Of course, uh, like it's still 1% worse than the first place. Uh, yeah, I, I still don't know what they used because, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll probably know that at some point. Um, um, so conclusions from that. Um, so here, unlike in Kaggle, I cannot check uh, my models against the leaderboard, so I have to really trust my course validation. So the validation scheme that I built, I have to really make certain that it's good, and then, uh, yeah, and use that and really trust it. Uh, again, it was uh, one of uh, these uh, unusual cases where ensembling didn't work, so sometimes it can happen. And again, if you have proper cross-validation scheme, then it should be possible to, to catch that, uh, like that ensembling doesn't work, that it overfits. And yeah, at the end, I preferred simple models to more complex ones, and that resulted in good runtime, and yeah, I was able to avoid, uh, avoid overfitting. One of the tools I used here was Feeder. Anybody heard of this, Feeder? So it's, um, a special tool for uh, which stores uh, data frames, pandas data frames, into a columnar binary format. It works really fast. So compared to like, uh, you can of course take data frame and save it to CSV, or you can take data frame and save it to pickle, or you can use fever, which would be 10 times faster. And on such data sets like this, it was really helpful like with experiments, because the data set was so large, so, and it was, it was able to read these uh, data frames very quick. So I totally recommend this library, and it also works in Python and R, so you can do something in Python and then read it from R and the other way around. Yeah, and at the end, uh, since it was a conference um, uh, competition, it was also possible to submit a paper with the approach to the uh, workshop at the conference, which is what I did, and it got accepted. It's not published yet, and other, uh, other teams, I hope, do, did the same, and when it's published, I hope I should be able to read the approaches about the approaches that they used. But uh, it's probably something more complex than NCM. Yeah, so all the code is, of course, open source. You can go check GitHub. Uh, yeah, and uh, you can read more about the uh, competition itself and the platform with this virtual machine that they used. So I um, actually I presented this, uh, like I gave this presentation already to, um, to Wikimedia. They luckily have an office here in Berlin, and they, uh, what they do is they work with um, Wikidata, so there are actually people sitting here in Berlin who, who need that, and I presented my approach there. And they say that my approach is the easiest uh, to integrate because like, it's feasible to actually use this, that in production because it's fast. They can't take it as is because uh, Wikidata is running on PHP, 
So they need to modify it, but since it uses this hashing trick, all they need to do is take some token, hash it, and then take the weights. So they are definitely going to integrate this at some point. Yeah. So the talk is almost over, but yeah, I wrote a book about Java for data science. I know that it's a weird place to uh, promote a Java book <laughs> in a Python conference, I know, yeah. But if anybody is interested, I have a free copy here, so come to me and talk. That's all. Um, so, thank you, thank you for the talk. It's really amazing to see um, like someone actually doing like a project and getting it into like use and all of that like form a competition. I have many many questions, especially about Java for data scientists, which sounds like an oxymoron. But I'll ask you later in private. What I really am wondering about is what you learn about distinguishing. Um, uh, co not corruption, how do you call it? Uh, vandalism. Mm -hmm. What you learned like from the model about distinguishing vandalism, because um, right, it, it's a sort of black box, but it's mm -hmm. an SVM, so we can understand mm -hmm. the features, we can understand the coefficients. What do you learn about v detecting vandalism? And in, and in general, what did you learn about doing this kind of project? Mm -hmm. What's like a take home message about the model itself? So take home was already, I mentioned that like trust in your validation scheme and uh, yeah, that was the most important thing and then sometimes ensembles don't work. Um, of course, like SVM is a linear model and I can look at coefficients and see what is the most, uh, like the stronger signal that uh, a revision is vandalic. I did that and it turned out that um, many vandals are from Spain. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I looked at like top uh, 10 features uh, by uh, like the weights of coefficients and yeah, Spain was there. And there were some IPs, like IP subranges, uh, like I mm, have no idea, I just thought okay, IP is very, so the user features, they were most uh, like most useful in that. So it's user who helps like, like it's a, some group of people who usually make these vandalic changes. Take it to the floor and maybe I'll ask one in the end if we have time. Questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so you said, first of all, that it was a 400 gig uh, data set. So I, I, if I understand correctly, you uh, processed that into a sparse matrix just by getting the features. So the first question is uh, how, much, how many rows were there once even after you processed? And the second is, just roughly how much, how much RAM would have that taken? So yeah, I have the answer here. So when I split here, so the training was almost 30 millions uh, of revisions. So this was the number of rows in the sparse matrix. And then of course, before uh, creating the final model, I took training validation into one matrix, like together and trained the final model there. So, and then it was like 30, uh, five uh, millions of uh, training examples. Uh, and it was able to fit into 32 gigs uh, of RAM. Uh, so because I didn't use this, um, uh, the content of each revision, which was the raw JSON file, which I think took most of the space. Uh, yeah. And of course, if I wanted to include more data, for instance, for year 2014, then it wouldn't be like my computer wouldn't be enough. So I, I actually tried uh, using some online methods like uh, stochastic gradient descent classifier from uh, scikit-learn. It was worse than just taking uh, this year, 2015. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, at the end, you mentioned that you use Feather. Uh, have you tried HDF5? Yes, it's a bit, uh, um, it's a bit, uh, it takes more time, yes. Oh, okay, thanks.
Okay, so maybe let me ask one more question. So, so you mentioned that a lot of vandalists are from Spain. Now, I, I want to learn something from, from this, you know, I want to learn something from the project, the successful project I did about uh, my, how to solve my problems. And I kind of want um, a way to, so I'm going to train a model and to, and, to, uh, and to test it, but I don't think it will work as well. So I'm kind of trying to learn how you extracted, like is vandalism really uh, country dependent or is it just, do you trust, okay, so the ROC is 0 0.96. Is this like a real result where the, you taught a classifier to understand vandalism or is it like, you kind of taught it how vandalism looks in particular months or years, and then it will change all the time and we'll have to retrain it. Is there any kind of deep insight to learn about how to work with big corpora of text about detecting vandalism or something else, for example? Yeah, so it's a few questions. So, uh, so the first was, like, the first thing is actually it's not about detecting vandalism, it's about detecting if this revision should be rolled back or not. And we assume that, okay, if revision is rolled back, it's because of vandalism, so we just make this assumption. And I think it's a pretty good assumption because usually that's the reason why revisions are rolled back. Um, but because there are so many, uh, like, because of the skew in the data, it's still, like, possible to overwhelm the moderators with a short list. Um, I, now it should be easier, of course. Uh, so it should be useful, in theory. But for Wikimedia, like they still have to to put this and see if it's really helpful. Because like uh, from my point of view, like 90% of AOC is quite good usually. Uh, but when there is such strong skew, it's hard to say. Yeah. So I hope it's useful for them. Any last question? Okay. Uh, so let uh, let's thank you.